This reading is from Censored, number 124, and the title is Of the People, By the People, and For the People. And before I begin the article, which is by William J. Eisenman, Ph.D., There, I'd like to read a couple of scriptures. Prove all things and hold fast that which is good. That comes from 1 Thessalonians 5.21. He that oppresses the poor to increase his riches, and he that gives to the rich, shall surely come to want. Proverbs 22, verse 16. He that makes haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Proverbs 28, verse 20. As the nail sticks to the stone, so sin sticks to buying and selling. Ecclesiastes 27, verse 2. And now the article. Workers have been abandoned by our politicians and our laws. Our politicians are detached from how people really feel. Almost 50 million people in America are living in poverty. While median pay for CEOs rose to $10.8 million, a 23% increase from 2009 while others suffer, the rich have been doing fine. For at least the last 30 years, hard-working people have been squeezed out of the economy, where big ticket items are concerned, that they once could afford, like a car. What has happened? We've always had greedy bastards in America. They've always indulged in political and societal corruption to increase their fortunes. But today, they own our government. They've rigged the game in their favor. They steal from us. The bailing out of Wall Street was the, quote, largest theft and cover-up in American history, unquote. We were fleeced. The people who caused the problem transferred the problem to ordinary people, those on Main Street. Cheating became the business model on Wall Street, and all their theft earned them huge rewards. The banks that caused the, the problems were considered too big to fail. The financial sector had been allowed to get too big and allowed to write its own rules. Lobbyists and the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, which changed its name due to too much exposure, ALEC wrote laws for politicians to enact. These laws and lack of regulations gave greedy bastards the green light to gamble, move production and jobs overseas, and not to pay taxes in America. Jobs shipped overseas depress wages in America. It has always been a wrong strategy to leave it to the private sector to provide us jobs, to provide, in many instances, for our survival. None of this kind of coercion will go on in the millennium under God's economics. In the millennium, every man will have his own land and vine. Micah 4, verse 4. Why is it 
that we don't hear about scriptures like this from prosperity preachers and right-wing conservative Christians. Daily, we are finding out that multinationals, our government, and we, the people, are not aligned concerning our goals. We, the people, are getting less of the economic pie, while corporations and the wealthy get more and more. They get away with robbing our treasury of their fair share of taxes. Our politicians are bought. We subsidize the big banks with zero interest loans. The claim that this country is a democracy republic is a cruel joke. The United States is a fascist country. A marriage between corporations and the state. In the 1950s, corporate taxes accounted for 30% of the money rolling into our treasury. Today, it's 7%. When they do pay taxes. Republicans won't cut a dime from our bloated military budget. And this has created a situation where every pig private contractor wants to wet his beak. These private contractors waste money and they pervert the objectives of U.S. purchasing priorities. The Pentagon loses money. It can't account for trillions of dollars. It's corrupt. But God forbid we try to correct this problem or dare cut a stinking dime from the Pentagon's budget. And we're called traitors, unpatriotic. The U.S. spends more on the Pentagon than all other countries combined. And yet our military is bogged down in a low-level conflict in Afghanistan. Conflict is... Conflict it is. Excuse me. Because Congress never declared war in both Iraq or Afghanistan. 1% of Americans own 35.6% of all private wealth, which is more than the bottom 90 95% combined. The 1% own 42.4% of all the financial wealth, which is more than the bottom 97% combined. The Forbes 400 wealthiest Americans have more wealth than over 150 million Americans. Between 1983 and 2009, 40% of all wealth gains went to the top 1%, and 82% of the wealth gains went to the top 5%. All these gains were not as a result of the top five percent working real hard. Today, corporations try mightily to shift costs to society, to shed jobs and extract wealth from our communities and the healthy economy. This upward redistribution of wealth is a deliberately crafted strategy. The rules of the economy were changed to benefit asset owners and to hell with the hard-working stiff. These changes benefited global corporations at the expense of local businesses. During the last 30 years, working hard and earning a wage didn't move you ahead. Real income, excluding inflation, has remained stagnant or fallen since the 1970s. The only way to obtain wealth in this economy is to start out wealthy. 
This is one of the dirty little secrets of capitalism. Capitalism requires capital. It's a rigged game. It's like starting one player out in Monopoly with 100 times the money the other players get. We know who's going to win that game. Capitalism is flawed and unfair. Because of extreme levels of inequality during the Gilded Age, 1890 to 1928, the income tax came into being with the explicit goal of reducing income and the concentration of wealth. The strategy worked for a while, but soon the wealthy got their way again. As the result of a brilliant propaganda campaign, they managed to get many of the poor and middle class to feel sorry for billionaires. After World War II, when the rules of the economy were changed to benefit the poor and middle class, corporations and the wealthy were taxed at high rates. Yes, the rules of the economy can be changed. Our economy is not ordained by God. In fact, our economy is based on the way of Git, which is Satan's way of life. All of our economic inequalities are man-made. Louis Brandeis, former Supreme Court Justice, said, quote, We can have concentrated wealth in the hands of a few, or we can have democracy, but we cannot have both. Unquote. The United States population in 2010 was 315 million people. 1% of 315 million is about 3 million people. And this 1% makes over $500,000 a year. And the average income of the 1% is about $1.5 million. Back in 1979, the top 1% earned 8% of the national income. But by 2007, this was up to 23%. They took in 6% of all income gains. Their inflation-adjusted average incomes grew by 224%. The bottom 90% got 8.6% of all income gains, and their income grew by only 5%. In 1913, before the income tax became law, the share of pre-tax income of the 1% was 18%, and in 1928 it was 23.9%. In 1976 it was 8.9%, and in 2009 it grew to 21.3%. In 2009, the wealthiest 1% of households owned 35.6% of all private wealth. In 1976, the figure was 20%. In the U.S., the top 10% own 82.8% of all financial assets, while the bottom 90% own 17.3%. Since the financial meltdown of 2007-2008, our wealthy have recovered from their wealth declines, while the rest of us have lost ground, probably permanently. About 10,000 households in America have wealth over $100 million, and 700 to 1,000 households are billionaires. Our 400 richest taxpayers paid an effective rate of 18.1%, while in 1961 the rate was 43.1%. Out of 7 billion people in the world, 
there are only 11 million millionaires and about 1,210 to 1,235 billionaires. Is that because the rest of us are too damn lazy to get ahead? Or are there man-made obstacles in our way? It's because of all the rule changes that coddle the rich at the expense of the poor and middle class. These changes have shattered the lives of billions around the world. Since the 1980s, wealth inequality has increased in the United States. In America, about 146,715 people donate more than $2,400 to political candidates. Politicians are bought. In 1979, the capital gains tax rate was 39%. In 2004, it was 15%. The 1% get over 80% of the capital gains income. Money makes money. Lazy earnings. <laughs> we as a nation organized our economy to benefit the rich and corporations. There is the money and the power. Something grotesque has taken place in America. And it was mentioned earlier, our poor and middle class actually support tax cuts for the rich and corporations. CEO pay in 1980 was 42 times that of the average worker, while today it has jumped to 325 percent to that average worker. Actually it's 325 times. When discussing corporate taxes, it is never mentioned that wages are tax deductible. They are a write-off for the corporation. Today's corporate tax is supposedly 35%. But when paid, when paid, the effective rate is 18.5%. Yet some 60% of our corporations pay no taxes and receive subsidies and refunds. This costs our Treasury $223 billion a year. This is wrong and needs to cease. Businesses that employ less than 500 workers are the real job creators in our economy creating 60 to 64 percent of all jobs. The business model of the big boys and girls is built to loot short-term profit grabbing. They shift costs off their balance sheets onto society, the environment, globally, and workers. They avoid accountability and responsibility. They pit communities and countries against each other in a race to the bottom, lowering standards. They are not against allowing the companies they deal with to employ child labor and slavery. Case in point is the chocolate industry. The big companies game the rules on global trade. They lobby for subsidies and tax breaks and tilt the field with deregulation. They get someone else to pay their taxes. They skew global investment rules. All of this creates inequality and moves the money upward, violating an important rule of economics 101. More money at the top means less money at the bottom. This causes a contraction of the economy, a recession or a depression. It's an economy suffering from an allocation problem. 
Extreme inequalities rip our communities apart with social divisions and distrust. It undermines both opportunity and social mobility. In America, it has been demonstrated that there is a strong correlation between social mobility and policies that redistribute income and wealth through taxation. After World War II, our government helped the middle class and the little guy. Today, our government helps the rich get richer. Today, the U.S. is among the least mobile of industrialized countries in terms of earnings. Our rich today don't want to pay for police and fire protection. They don't want to pay for public schools or libraries. All they want are tax cuts or having to pay no taxes at all. And to ensure these ends, they seek an impotent government so small it can be drowned in the bathtub. Too much inequality leads to economic instability, recession, or depression. Since the 1970s, the wages of the bottom 80% have been stagnant. Where did all that money go? It went to profits for corporations, the rich, and Wall Street. During the 1970s, the economy was changed to reorient it toward the short-term interests of the 1%. Did you think it had something to do with the magic of the market? Smart MBAs? Or God? Nah. If the 1% today paid the effective tax rate they did in 1961, the deficit would be $231 billion less each year. In 2009, there were 1,500 millionaires who paid no taxes. Between 2001 and 2010, the U.S. had to borrow nearly one trillion dollars to give tax breaks to the one percent. Tax breaks for the rich are supposed to improve the economy and create jobs. This has not happened. It did happen in the 1990s with a tax increase and there was no deficit. There was a surplus when President Bill Clinton left office tax cuts for the rich has slowed the economy and shifted the tax burden to the middle class and the poor. When do we stop this nonsense? When do we start calling a bribe a bribe? When do we start calling the corrupt crooks? Some things we can do we must provide a real living minimum wage. We must have basic labor standards and protections. No more war on unions. Of course, if all employers practiced fair labor standards, there would be no u need for unions. Unions didn't just pop up out of the ground like mushrooms. There was a need. We must take money and parties out of politics. We must stop corporate tax dodging. Education must be free. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. We must provide free universal health care. The financial sector must be well regulated and taxed. CEO pay must be brought into reality. We must end the fascism that has gripped our government. The marriage between corporations and the state is fascism, and corporate rule today is unchecked. Today, Monsanto is poisoning our food, and our corrupt politicians have given them the green light to continue. GMOs are dangerous and not healthy. 
We must get rid of bad laws such as Citizens United, KIDA, and those granting tax loopholes and making it profitable to ship our jobs overseas. We must honor labor and the actual earning of income. Money making money is not earning. We must have no speculating in commodities. And no one, no one, Nestle, Nestle's CEO, no one owns air and water. One, as Dr. Jonas Salk said, you can't patent the sun. Our country must be returned to we the people. Adam Smith warned that unchecked self-interest aided by the government will spoil the benefits of capitalism. Since 1980 the United States economy has more than doubled. Still average income peaked in 1973 at $33,000 but by 2005 this was down to $29,000. Workers have been getting poorer while corporate and financial profits have been soaring. What we have learned from this and our social experiment after World War II is that the distribution of income in a society is the product of government rules. It has nothing to do with a mythical free market or an invisible hand. Today, we sacrifice for the rich at the expense of the poor. It is now common knowledge that since 1980 it has become official policy to ensure that the rich receive the benefits of government. We have been involved in a reverse Robin Hood scenario one-third of our economy depends on government spending. However, in recent years money to support this sector has gone to tax breaks for the rich and subsidies and giveaways to those who already have. The elites have captured the government and are milking it for their own benefit. Government has become the servant of the rich. One wonders how these people who call themselves Christian get away with continually twisting and resting the words of God. How do their words and actions expose them as frauds, liars? Excuse me, how do not their words and actions expose them as frauds, liars, and counterfeit Christians? In Proverbs 82, 16, it is made clear that charity requires sacrifice, not just the writing of a check. If you think something is worthwhile, then do something positive in support of it. Maybe even afflict yourself, that is, sacrifice to do the right thing. It's up to you and us to straighten out the mess we're in. Only we can return our government and our economy to we the people. A government of the people, by the people, and for the people. The end.